Yeah, so today we're just going to do, um, we're going to be starting a new series of lectures to do with biochemistry and kind of the basics at university level and uh, yeah, let's get on with it. So we talk about, starting to talk about intermediate metabolism, so kind of when things c come into the body, what, what happens with them and the real basic to get us prepared for when we go into detail and start talking about disorders and uh, stuff like that. So kind of the first thing is to talk about why we need fuels. So we have three major sources that we get them from. So carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. All of them are used to made, make ATP. And that's used for many different processes in the body, such as biosynthesis, detox, muscle contractions, thermogenesis, anything you can think of. Basically, at some point, we'll require ATP. So it is very important to have a constant flow of ATP in the body. So if we break down what happens to each of those, uh, so carbohydrates, they basically go through, say we get glucose from that, which go through glycolysis, and then the tricitric uh, acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, and, and then also oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, lipids go through beta oxidation to make the acetyl-CoA, and then again TCA, uh, and then proteins, transformation, and TCA again. So that Krebs cycle is very important because it yields the most amount of ATP. But we'll talk about each of those through in the progressing lectures. So if we kind of, so we eat stuff, it gets to the intestines, then absorbed. So we're uh, in the cytosol of a cell, for example, we have that glucose ready. Um, and that's turned into pyruvate, uh, as well as CoA, uh, and reducing agents, uh, such as NAD+. And that's done via this, uh, this enzyme um, complex, pyruvate dehydrogenase multi-enzyme complex. Uh, and that glucose is then broken down through the process of glycolysis, as we talked about, which is then turned into the central acetyl-CoA molecule, and that can also be made from beta oxidation. So yeah, then if we talk about how different how different cells use use this energy, so we've got erythrocytes, so red blood cells, so they obviously don't have mitochondria because we want to maximize the room for oxygen in the cells to supply our muscles, and then also maintain a flexibility to access capillaries. Because they only have mitochondria, they can only um, go through anaerobic glycolysis, and yeah, they can't go through the whole Krebs cycle, which usually happens in the mitochondria. And they have this molecule called hexokinase, which turns this uh, glucose into lactate um, and then lactic acid, which is why we may get pain after after doing exercise because of that buildup of lactic acid. So if we talk about the brain, obviously the brain does a lot of important stuff throughout the body and it's the, the center point. So that's why it has a high metabolic demand because it does loads of things every day. The brain cells obviously can use this, use the energy to go through aerobic respiration to pyruvate and then acetyl-CoA. Um, but however, when, when glucose storage are low, we can use ketone bodies to keep supplying the body with the needed molecules. And we'll go through what ketones bodies are and how they're made later on. And uh, so muscles, they don't really have a preference. They'll take anything as long as it provides them with energy. So glucose or fatty acid. And they can go through this aerobic glycolysis and a Krebs cycle. And then hepatocytes. So that's kind of the center part of all the utilization of energy, which we'll go on to talk about. That can perform um, phosphorylation on glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. And then that can be and then stored as glycogen and glycogenesis uh, in the liver. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Also, excess glucose can be used to make this acetyl-CoA again to make fatty acids and cholesterol. And the ribose 5-phosphate uh, can be made um, to then be utilized for nucleotides and as the backbone of that and NADPH as well. So if we talk about uh, blood glucose in a bit more detail and why it's important um, and, how, and how it's stored, so we've got that blood glucose uh, concentration of about 4.5 to 5.5 uh, in a concentration in the blood and at fasting that can range between 2.8 and 7. However, when we're in, such as in diabetics, when that glucose gets too low, we've got this process of glycation occurring where glucose starts to stick, stick into protein and then this formation of, uh, formation of advanced glycogen end products which basically causes proteins to change shape and uh, stop working, which is not ideal. So we don't want that. And the blood also becomes very viscous. So that means it takes the heart more energy to pump it around, kind of like honey dripping down. Obviously, yeah, it'll go down very slowly and it will take a lot of energy uh, for the heart to push it around. So, so if we talk about um, how the gly glucose is stored, so it's obviously turned into um, glycogen with the use of uh, the hormone insulin. But then in this glycogen, we've got this glycosidic bond forming at the first and um so if we look at the image up here, we've got carbon one. 
So we've got that link between carbon one and carbon two via this glycosidic bond here. And this is done through the enzyme glycogen synthase. But then um, once every every couple glucose molecules, we've got this formation of um, carbon one to six bond. And that's done um, by glucose branching enzyme. And yeah, it creates this thin globular shape for the glycogen. Yeah, you can look it up if you want. And yeah, that makes it basically stabilizes the molecule more. And yeah, kind of reduces the, the chance of it splitting. And then we've got kind of the reverse of that if we want to go the other way, we've got glycogen phosphorylase uh, and then debranching enzyme if we want to go the other way. So kind of the pathway that glucose takes. So yeah, from the bloodstream, it enters through the GLUT2 and transporter into the liver and then glucokinase will uh, phosphorylate glucose into glucose 6 phosphate then insulin would help out and turn this into um, glycogen through the process of glycogenesis and then using these enzymes glycogen synthase and glucose branching enzyme and then the other way gly glycogen will then be um, split via glycogenolysis so if we think about those stem words genesis to make and lysis meaning to break so then the glycogen is broken back into glucose 6-phosphate and this is um, facilitated for the use of the hormone glucagon. Um, so then we've got that glucose 6-phosphatase which will break glucose 6-phosphate into glucose again. Um, so yeah, if we're uh, also fasting, kind of a, a little note here, we can use this fructose 1,6-biphosphate which will um, see further on uh, and pyruvate carboxylase uh, as well as um, lactate, glycerol and uh, alanine, so these are um, amino acids. Uh, puff and lactate obviously uh, and that can be used for gluconeogenesis so if we have low glucose levels we can make our own glucose from these um, uh, organic molecules here so we can see this diagram here uh, from a from a biochemistry textbook so we've, we start with glucose up here and as we talked about we can either have hexokinase or glu glucokinase here which will turn glucose into glucose 6 phosphate. And then we have another enzyme that makes fructose 6 phosphate. So, this is the process of glyco glycolysis here. Um, so, then, then we have this important enzyme called phosphofructase uh, kinase um, or PFK, which turns fructose 6 phosphate into fruc fructose 1 6 phosphate. And you can see this uh, molecule is kind of central to this reaction here. And it can either turn into dihydroxy acetone phosphate or bialdolase and be turned into gly glycylaldehyde free phosphate. And yeah, we can follow this reaction. And because this is such a central molecule, this enzyme here, PFK, can then be used for um, regulation because it's, it's so central. And then here we have things that will speed up. PFK and inhibit it. So it will either increase the rate of glycolysis or decrease it. Pretty, uh, pretty much it in this. So it's, this is kind of like the metabolism of the, other, of the fuel and how we can then utilize uh, to make energy. Uh, so if we talk about fatty acids, so we've got it here. So on the left here, we've got our carboxylic head at the top and our um, tail at the bottom. So this is um, just a single fatty acid molecule and the head is hydrophilic, so uh, water loving and hydrophobic uh, tail at the bottom. So you can remember phobic, if you've got a phobia or scared or something. So we know this is the water hating. And because it has both those hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties, we call it an amphipathic and molecule should be an A in there. Uh, and these travel bound to albumin um, in the blood. Then when we store it, we can store it as these tricyglycerols. Um, here we've got gl uh, the glycerol. And we've got our fatty acids which attach to it via a condensation reaction, meaning that water is released when these two molecules bind. So if we talk about how this is done, so again we're in the liver. So when glucose enters, we add that GLUT2, it then can, it's turned into this acetyl-CoA. Uh, and then with the use of carbon dioxide, it will turn this to, in this to um, malonyl-CoA. Uh, and then fatty acids and these can then either be further used for esterification or it can leave via fatty acid transporters out the liver to be used somewhere else and this is the process of lipogenesis so if we then use these fatty acids for esterification and um, they can be made into fatty acid acyl coa with glycerol free phosphate um, and then with, again with the use of insulin um, it's turned into this triacyglycerol um, so if we think about insulin as kind of a storing hormone it kind of wants to put and molecules into tissues whereas glucagon kind of wants to do the opposite and release everything another pathway that this fatty acetyl coa can uh, take is through the cpt1 enzyme and that's when this fatty acetyl coa uh, will be turned to co2 and these ketone bodies so if we're low on uh, low on glucose this pathway uh, will be favored and ketone bodies 
will be made to supply the brain. Uh, and this pathway is therefore then inhibited uh, if we have high malonyl CoA. So yeah, if we think about uh, hormones, kind of summarize. So insulin promotes storage and uptake to tissue. So glycolysis, uh, glycogenesis, lipogenesis, and protein synthesis. Whereas glucose promotes the release of fuels, so gluconeogenesis, so the making of new glucose to then be used, and uh, glycogenolysis, so breaking down of that glycogen to then uh, allow glucose to be used for energy, lipolysis, so we can use um, lipids for energy and protein breakdown again. So yeah, well, these hormones kind of work in balance and uh, it kind of inhibit and promote each other um, all the time to get that balance in the body right and obviously if one of them isn't working such as in diabetes and insulin isn't working properly then um, we can see how this can be uh, problematic so yeah uh, thank you for listening and uh, that's pretty much i'll see you in the next video on the mechanisms of metabolism thank you like and subscribe